merch alert. That's right. You heard her. We have merch now. If you're looking for a mug, a hoodie, a shirt, a blanket, we're your people. Be sure to check out our exclusive I Was a Bravo Fan Before Scandaball tees. They will be perfect to wear while watching the VPR reunion. Check out the link in the description of the podcast or our Instagram bio. Hello, hello, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of Bravo, where Black, unfortunately, Kaya is not with us today, but we're sending her so much love because I know that she would definitely want to be here today for our special guest. We have Erica Cobb from Come Back with Erica Cobb, but also Daytime Talk After Dark. How are you today? Listen... <laughs> It's been a long time coming. When you when we were when we first tried to set this up, I know a few things happened because I believe we were in Miami. Yes, you were. You were living la vida loca. I know, I know. And I was so bummed because I'm like, I really want to talk to her. I really want to hear your thoughts because I'm really into what you do with um your podcast or I guess your your talk show and the spirituality and things like that. Like, I'm really into that. I love talking to a spiritual person, even though we end up talking Bravo 90% of the time. (laughs) But I believe it's nice to mix both. How are you today? I am so good, Erin. I'm so sorry that Kay is not here, but we are going to hold it down for her because we love our good sis. And I just want to be uh, very transparent that I beg to be on this podcast. Uh, I, I, y'all were, <laughs> and I was like, hey, I'm a cousin. Why haven't you ever asked me? And I never do that. But I was like, mm-hmm. I was driving my car one day and I was like, I want to be on the podcast. Why haven't they asked me to be on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it was coming. And we're so, we love when people ask to come on because it I don't know it just gets us more excited because yeah. it's like wow you want to talk to us like okay yes. come on like come on down <laughs> um so we're going to get to know you for a bit because I want to know how did your love for Bravo start like what show was it what got you hooked okay so as you alluded to my brand is comeback with Erica Cobb which is my mm-hmm. podcast YouTube, all of that. Um, but how I started with Bravo was actually I got hooked through Portia's journey. So okay. when Portia first came on to Real Housewives of Atlanta, she was just so like, you know, pie in the sky, like just all over the place. You know, she was a real true housewife. And then when her life started falling apart with her husband, Cordell, basically filing for divorce and all of the things that happened, I started watching her journey because quite frankly, in a weird way, it kind of reminded me of my own situation. Like I was married very, very young and I was still in that marriage when I started watching Portia. I knew that we were getting divorced at that point. And I knew I had to start over. And when I saw Portia, and I'm no offense to Portia, I think Portia is a great housewife and she's a great personality. Um, But she was really like a deer in headlights. And I thought, if she has figured out this much in terms of how to put one foot in front of the other, I can too. So Portia was kind of my comeback inspiration. And I just thought it was so interesting to see these chronicles of journeys of how people can like fall and get back up and have their setback seasons and emerge even greater than they were before. And Mm -hmm. a part of that was like kind of the genesis of my brand, because that's exactly what I had to do. And you you know what, when you say that, you're so right. I'd say out of everybody's storyline on Housewives of Atlanta, Portia's was the most like, it gave me Housewives. Like, it gave me her starting over from scratch and then growing as a person. you literally watching her grow every season. You right. know, she went from talking about the Underground Railroad, mm-hmm. and that was one of my favorite scenes, too. And I know Portia's like, y'all won't let me live that down, but it was funny. <laughs> And I know that she knows better. Like, she knows better and she's educated herself. Um, And we've just seen her come such a long way. And looking at her now, I'm like, she's just 
gorgeous and she just has all this stuff going for her like yeah it's unbelievable it's incredible uh, it's inspiring and that's mm-hmm. the reason why on my podcast i facilitate telling the stories of other people who have had setback seasons, how they came yeah. back, you know, the ideas behind a comeback. And I just think that Portia is like one of the greatest comeback queens of all times. So, you know what? It, it brings me to this question. What advice would you give someone who is going through a setback season right now? So I think, you know, people always say troubles don't last always and mm-hmm. they don't, you know, um, that's just inevitable as the world continues to move. However, I think that setback seasons are also a breeding ground to how to troubleshoot your life. There are so many things that you're like, you know, heading, you're hitting your head against the wall on so many avenues because it's generally not just one thing that, you know, cultivates in a a setback season it's generally seemingly seemingly a series of events and at the root of those events generally is one or maybe two things that are causing all of these other things to happen so while you're in your setback season and that tends to be a quieter time for most people i would start troubleshooting the things that aren't working to get to the root of what those one or two foundational things are Because if it is a relationship that is no longer serving you or it's adding toxicity into your life, that's manifesting in the way you're showing up to work and the way you're showing up as a friend. There's so many things that it's like, well, I'm not showing up so well at work and I'm not showing up so well uh, as a friend. And those two things could be from the same source. It could be the fact that you're living in toxicity on a daily basis. And once you get to that point, It's the saying you don't tolerate what you hate and then you stop tolerating it because you hate it so much. And that's when you get kind of the motivation to move on and set up your comeback season. Oh, that's a word. See, (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to rewind this and listen to this myself because I feel like I'm in the moment, but I need to put in my headphones and listen to this. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So speaking of Atlanta and speaking of Portia, have you seen those weird AI videos that are coming out. No. It's like they they do them on each franchise. Atlanta has theirs now. And it's like AI versions of them in like this Bridgerton type world. Like I don't even know how to explain it. It's it kind of reminds me of Game of Thrones. Like they have castles, they're dressed with like ballroom gowns. It's like royalty. But it's the weirdest thing. I have to send it to you. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep an eye out for that because I really don't think I've seen it, which is surprising because I watch a lot of Yeah, podcasts. because it's it's coming out. I seen it the other day and I'm like, what is this and why is it so interesting? Yeah. <laughs> because it's like a minute long. So if you guys have seen it, let me know in the comments because I'm going to definitely post it in one of the clips or probably post it to the story and I'll send it to you as well. So okay. you can take a look. All right. I'll keep an eye out for it. Are you excited for Atlanta to come back? I am excited for Atlanta, um, but I'm always excited. Even when everybody Mm. else is like, oh, this person's not there. This isn't going to happen. I'm still like, new content. (laughs) I just want to (laughs) know. (laughs) I just want to know what's going on. Um, Yeah, you know, I I feel like there's so many changes and shakeups. I mean, that Kenya situation completely blew me. It blew all of us. Um, It still doesn't sit right with me because we really don't understand what exactly happened, what's going on currently. Um, But ultimately, Atlanta has been able to stand the test of time because there is culture in Atlanta. Atlanta is the forefront of, you know, making all the things happen. If you look at even the other Housewives franchise, everybody pulls from Atlanta. Like there really is any other franchise that you can say that about. Like sometimes I'll see someone doing, a you know, a sit down uh, interview and their confessionals. And I'm like, oh, that was totally a Nini move or oh, she got that from Portia. You know, like that's something that, you know, Candy would say it's so obvious because you're looking at it kind of apples to apples. So I am excited for Atlanta because Atlanta is really kind of where everything jumped off. 
That's so true. I, I think the thing that scared me the most about this upcoming season is just the cash shakeup. Like we're seeing so many different people. Uh, but once they said that they were putting Phaedra back, uh, I was kind of excited about that. But then I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, maybe not because I'm kind of curious as to what she's going to bring. I'm also hearing things about cameras picking back up for Kenya. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm not too sure if that's true or not, or people just are just saying stuff just to get everybody like all amped up and excited. Yeah. I have an unpopular opinion. <laughs> so I'm do just, tell. I'm going to share it here. I have been, I've interviewed Phaedra a few times and she is a lovely person. I still like in, during the interview, all of that, I still struggle with, the Phaedra situation. I, what she did to Candy, it's still something that weighs on me. Like anytime I see her, because if you've ever been in a friendship where you find out that your best friend is your biggest op, that stays with you for, I mean, it can stay with you for life if you let it, but it stays with you for a significant amount of time. And not only your biggest op, to do something as a as much of a betrayal as what Phaedra did, but the nastiness, the nefarious nature of what they were discussing, especially this was before people forget that this was before Me Too. This was like when we were just starting to learn about Cosby. So the movement was very much starting in that space. And shortly mm -hmm. after that is when if you had anything that resembled an allegation, you were canceled. So Candy could have easily have been canceled indefinitely for something like that. And I think we just moved on and just kind of forgot about it. But when she said, you know, you came for my reputation, I felt that deeply. And I, it's still just, it always, anytime I see her, it just always gives me yeah. a little bit of the ick. Like, you know, I, I don't know how else to say it. I know everybody's like, and I am a person who says you are deserving of the comeback you're willing to earn, but you can't just absolve yourself of all responsibility to everyone moving forward. I definitely understand where you where uh, where you're coming from because when it comes to Phaedra, I do feel like it's kind of like that awkwardness, like you're waiting for her to bring up that situation and give some kind of justification for it, but it's like. Right. She just does not seem to do it. And I feel like because Candy is on the up and up, like you said, this didn't affect, of course it affected her emotionally. And yeah. I think just looking back at it, that it's something that could be very scarring for her, but it didn't affect her financially. Like she's still successful and she still was able to move on without any dirt on her back. So I feel like maybe that's why people were a bit more forgiving and it's weird because aside from that situation, their relationship has just always been very interesting to me. Even that prior season, seeing how uh, Candy was there for Phaedra and all the weird stuff with uh, Candy kind of communicating with Apollo behind mm -hmm. Phaedra's back, I feel. Like, it was just a bunch of stuff that kind of led up to that moment. And I definitely don't think that's right at all. Um but I say that to say that they're just their relationship in general is just very interesting. And it just makes you wonder, like, how did how did we get here? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree The relationship as all relationships are are very nuanced. But yeah. I will say the reason why Candy was able to get out of that without, you know, much backlash had nothing to do with what the executioner or who the executioner was. Mm -hmm. That's called God and your ancestors. That's why you should talk to them every day because the weapons that are being formed against you will not flourish in any know, way. That's right. will not prosper if you have conversations with them. That is the the uh, lesson of the day here, kids. All right. <laughs> I know that's right. A word, a word. So speaking of the franchises that kind of started it all, um, we're going to head to Potomac. Okay. Because I feel like, well, I don't know if that started at all, but it was pretty close in my book. How are you feeling about Potomac this season? Um, how do you feel about this whole situation with Karen? Do you feel like she is taking accountability? 
What do you think so far? Oh, this is so hard. And I've talked about this before with Karen. I love the Grand Dame. I love her so much. <laughs> but Karen's lack of accountability is palpable. And I would go as far to say that her historic lack of accountability is what got her to this place of allegedly a second DUI. Um. It's just when you are able to get away with something and you don't really have repercussions for something as egregious, and I do think that driving while intoxicated is egregious, especially when you're a person of resource, like what you have to almost like threaten me to drive. I I mean, and that even mm. when I'm sober, like I'm like, can I get a car? Is there an Uber somewhere? Right. Like, I don't want to drive, you know? Um, so the idea that anyone is doing that, it's just, it's not okay. But Karen is like one of those people that she has to learn her lesson the hard way. And I think that she really hasn't had hard lessons around this. And that's Thank the you. reason why she's handling it in such a different way than I think most of us would have expected her to handle it. And that's disappointing. And this is someone who I love to watch on television. Again, yeah. a lovely woman, beautiful gowns. But girl, you have to take this as a not only a learning opportunity, but also a teaching opportunity. Right. Right. And I want I want to say in advance to our listeners, I know a lot of people are probably tired of me asking that question <laughs> because every episode I start off because it's like it's the elephant in the room when you're watching the show. You're kind of like you're excited about all the other stuff that's going on. But you're this is this is really what's happening in the background. Yeah. The tension is thick. Yeah. And the news that's coming out like in real time about how, you know, she's contesting the arrest, I believe, um, as saying that the officer was asking her questions that were violating her rights, you know, things like that. And it's like, girl, were you drinking and driving or were you not? Like at that point, it, and you hit a tree. Like, <laughs> I mean, if it was like, I got pulled over. I mean, I could see that being something if you're like, I got pulled over. There was no, you know, cause for me being pulled over. But you hit a tree. <laughs> like, that's probable yeah. cause enough. Like, I don't, I don't understand the, and I mean, it could be a legal strategy too, because who knows? I don't know the laws where they live. So maybe mm -hmm. being her second offense could actually cost her some jail time or maybe some probation, um, strict probation. Who knows? But I'm sure there's a reason why she's doing it this way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. You know what? I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt because I do believe we're early in the season. So maybe there will be like something that comes throughout maybe the mid episode or towards the finale where we finally get what we're looking for mm -hmm. that big moment where she just um addresses everything in a, in a manner that's respectful and appropriate do you just onto the lighter side of things do you think that Jacqueline was justified in sharing that um Karen was drinking while they were on the phone or she thought Karen was drunk while they were on the phone together having a conversation so if I remember correctly, wait, did she actually bring it to camera or did Mia say that that's what she said? Yes. Yes. This was yeah. Mia that said that. Right. So when Mia said, oh, well, she's, yeah, she called Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. Apparently she was drunk or something. So I don't blame that on Jacqueline because if you're having a conversation, even if you're on a reality TV show, but you're having a conversation with your friend of decades, like I'm sure there's a lot of things that are said that wouldn't necessarily be said on camera. But the decision to bring it up, I mean, we should have taken that as clue number one that Mia was on Karen takedown time. Because mm. like she's coming. That was the one. And then the two was when she made that comment about her butt dialing and what they overheard. So I was like, oh, Mia's just full fledged coming for Karen. And I was trying to remember, like, did Karen 
do something to Mia, I couldn't remember like what the history of their yeah. relationship was. I think it has something to do with maybe that conversation that they had on, I believe, the first episode with the hat party where she brought up um, her being like a not so great mom. It was like that that type of context. I th- it was that conversation with her, Giselle and Mia, where she got up and walked away from the table. I'm like, did it have something to do with that? Because I, I thought that Karen apologized and seemed to show like remorse for it. So I don't understand. Uh, yeah, I, I think she, uh, this is a tough season for Karen. I will say that much. Like I do yeah. not envy her position at all. Um, I mean, granted it was by her own doing, but I don't envy that position because if she initiates, if she's the one who starts some, so then there will be some, And she seemingly just organically does that. I don't even know if she means to do it. I think she just does it. But if I were her, my strategy would have been in to come in as quiet as a church mouse. Like, let everybody just, I would have been Shannon Bedore (laughs) 2.0. Let me just come in, broken bird, crooked wing, you know? Right. (laughs) Everybody throws stones at me and like, see what happens. And that strategy worked for her. You know, Karen chose a different, more, you know, I'm going to be the grand don still and I'm going to act like everything is okay. And I don't know if that's working for her. You know what? It's funny you say that too, because often I have thought about this since we've seen the whole Shannon situation with her getting a DUI. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're also seeing what she's up against with Alexis Bellino and John Jansen. I often wonder if Karen was in that same position, how would she handle it? Would she handle it the same way that she's handling this DUI or would she go the take the Shannon approach and kind of just sit back? and watch everything happen. I think Karen likes to be on the offensive. I think her strategy generally going in is to play offense and then mitigate the defense. Shannon's strategy is going in is to play defense. Yeah. She's and, like <laughs> Yes, like she her she's always, you know, everything's always coming to her because I think that Shannon is kind of the consummate victim. Whereas Karen is more of like the consummate heroine. You know, she is the strength. She's the pillar of the community. You know, she wants She's to the fence. that. Right. So I think it's very difficult for her to take a back seat on that because it just isn't in her nature to do so. I think it's her survival technique. And I will be honest, although I don't agree with everything that she does, it is very interesting to watch like yeah it's very good because i'm like she is good at this because how she took jacqueline down and how she made her cry and then she was like i don't care if you cry you can cry so the cows come home i was just like she doesn't give a damn karen does not care at all well honestly that's why she and giselle are such great counters to each other like they can go back and forth between who's the protagonist and who's the antagonist Mm -hmm. because those two have gone through some very public real world things and real life things so this is almost like cosplay and child's play to be on camera playing housewives to them because They've had consequential things that they've had to deal with in the not so distant few or not so distant past. So when you're looking at like a Karen, because the idea of someone, she married Ray and obviously Ray was very well off. He was the black Bill Gates and to marry someone and grow accustomed to that type of lifestyle that you clearly aren't living in your golden years and having a public tax battle and all of that is a lot like I mean that is like for anyone when I so um 10 over 10 years ago I went through bankruptcy unemployment and divorce all at the same time and one thing that I would always pray a prayer of gratitude to about was that I didn't have a a lot to begin with like I thought about Mm -hmm. some of my friends or people who I knew in the industries that I worked in or athletes 
who had made millions upon millions of dollars. And fast forward five, 10 years, they had absolutely nothing to show for it. And it's a lot easier to make like tens to maybe a, a hundred thousand or something like that, like it and get that back than it is to make millions upon millions of dollars and get that back, especially if it's such a specialized skill set or a moment in time. So oh, Karen, yeah. having actually gone through that, um, makes me think that her and Giselle with all of her Jamal Bryant stuff um, really understand what's real and what's television. Oh, that's definitely a good take. And I, and I do notice that they are a lot closer. And I don't know if that's because Giselle wants like a, she wants to fill a safe space because Robin's not there anymore. Or if it's just like a genuine respect that she now has with Karen. That's what I'm trying to figure out too. Yeah. I see what, well, it, what makes it complicated though, is what went down on was it the second episode with um the the party yeah splitting the party mm -hmm. um between karen's apparently last minute award and, and uh giselle's uh cancer charity or yeah. uh, charity party um i think that that was a line in the sand for the season that i don't think we're quickly going to move past i just think the last episode didn't give us a lot of indication of where they were with that yeah because it's like it seems and and that's what i'm noticing with giselle it seems like she is ending feuds a lot quicker than she would normally end mm -hmm. them because last season, Giselle would be ready to go all right. day. And this season, it seems like she's apologizing and just expressing herself. And it's it's a weird, it's kind of weird to see. Like, I want it to happen. Yeah. But I'm like, no, actually be, you know, be an asshole a little bit to some of these ladies. It's fun to watch. Now, yeah. how do you how do you feel about some of the newbies that we're getting like? Uh, Stacy, do you think that Stacy's boring? Stacy is just that media girl, mm -hmm. you know. There, it's. I am. Um, I think Stacy and I might be around the same age. I'm 43, maybe. Yeah, I think we're somewhere around the same age, and that's how we were told to be. You know, basically. I mean, I've been in media for 20 plus years at this point. 20, mm -hmm. gosh, 20 four years at this point. I started when I was 19. And uh, yeah, it was like, I was in a kind of different situation because I started in radio. But when I was on television, I had to pull out the pageant girl. Like I was the pageant girly. And until radio kind of beat that out of me, <laughs> I would be a Stacy. But Stacy is gorgeous and she looks like a supermodel. And I'm sure every uh, job that she's gotten, it's been leaning on that aesthetic. So it's very difficult to break that at this point in her life. So I feel like for her, I don't think that a lot of people are saying it comes across as disingenuous, but I don't think it's disingenuous. I just think that that's who she is now because that's who she's always been kind of cultivated to be. I don't know if she makes the most compelling like, <laughs> television on this side of the equation, you know, on reality TV, but who knows? It's only a few episodes in and I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. She, I call her, uh kenya light uh she reminds me of kenya like they're just the aesthetic mm -hmm. you know um uh, kenya light is what i'll call her i can see Great that girl. Yeah. yeah i you know what and i think she's an amazing fit like i really do feel like i like it it's kind of giving me the good parts of katie ross that we appreciated and love so much yeah. but just like with a little qvc <laughs> and the one thing that I did agree with, though, is when they call her stiff. Like, I don't think she's boring at all, but I think she's just very stiff. And I think she should loosen up a bit. But it's also funny to see how she thinks that she's the total opposite. Like, she's like, I'm cool. I'm fun. Yeah. yeah and I think she is. I, I really mm -hmm. think that she is like a fun girl. I just think 
the brand might be, especially, see, here's the thing. Has she come in with, even during the Katie Ross era, then she would have been probably a even more seamless fit at, in Potomac. But yeah. she came in after Mia. And, and Mia has taken Potomac in a completely different direction. And so I think that's a part of the reason why it seems like she's like struggling a bit to fit in because we've had two seasons of things that we have never experienced on this show. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, the idea that you're talking about the paternity of your son on camera is like wild, you know, it's just wild in any place, but I, I don't think that that's something that we're used to seeing on Bravo. It was definitely different. Yeah. And she's just so like in your face about it. Like, Hey, this yeah. is what's going on in my life. And I always get this weird feeling. It's like the same feeling I get whenever I watch players club. That's the same feeling I get whenever I watch me. Like whenever I see her, <laughs> go into like these airbnbs the airbnb that she went into uh -huh. and then jacqueline comes with like her kids i just get this weird feeling i'm like what's going on who's sleeping with who are you guys all sleeping with each other like what's happening it's is it not bizarre there seems to be more to the story than just the fact that gordon lives in the building that they yeah. need to get because I was watching that and I I said to myself, like, Erica, you're being very judgy. Like, don't be so judgy. And, but then my husband came in and he, you know, just chimes in commentary. Sometimes he'll sit down and like watch it with me. Other times he's like, you know, just in and out. But he goes, mm -hmm. that's a sad birthday party. And he just walked <laughs> out. And I was thinking like. I was thinking the same thing. Like, if you're going to get an Airbnb, I was kind of expecting what she took the girls to. That right. time. Like, oh, we're going to stay at an Airbnb for the weekend. But this is kind of giving, like, I might be VRBOing the place that I'm in for an extra couple thousand, and I'm going to stay yeah. here. It's, it, it's, it was weird. Like, the house was weird. It was just a weird situation to me i don't know why it just i don't know i think for myself i would be like oh it's good it's time to turn up but for a housewife it's a little bit different because we're looking at the inside of your house and when you're, we're like your house looks better than this so right. why wouldn't you just stay home right right why and wouldn't you just invite her to your house very strange and then there's a disconnect with the aesthetic when we're following these people on social media it's like oh, you are with the queen. You know, like, you're mm -hmm. doing this, like, Donatella's <laughs> coming around the corner, like, all these things. And then it's like, what is this? Like, I would have given up my meeting with Donatella to have Donatella at home. We can have Donatella at home if we're not going to create one-day experiences. Like, that. that's always what's going through my mind. Like, I'm always doing the math, like, what is happening? Is this real or is this being put on for the cameras? And I hate moments like that because you do feel very judgy. I'm just like, yeah. did they just go to Dollar Tree and just pull all of this together? Or is this like, you know, or is it really the best that she can do right now? Like, I don't know. But see, here's my thing is this because um, there is I'm I'm really uh, good friends with Buffy Purcell. And from she was on Married to Medicine mm -hmm. season, and she is like honestly a, a financial genius. She's like, uh, I know that there's she has very mixed reactions amongst the Bravo sphere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as someone who knows her personally, um, she is my fi one of my financial advisors, and she is good. Okay, um, mm -hmm. she, my situation all around. And when she would always say, you know, wealth whispers and money jingle jangles. And it's like, when you're, when you are providing an aesthetic to make it seem as if your life is a certain way, then we are only holding you to the measure of which you have told us that you're living. The yeah. lifestyle that you said you're accustomed to is what we're accustomed to seeing. So it's almost like, you know, I almost prefer the way that Gina does it. Like <laughs> Gina, 
Although it's not a fit for, you know, aspirational television. Yeah. But it's like anytime Gina comes in, you know, looking great, it looks like her situation is improving. You know, she's doing these cool things. I'm like cheering her on because I'm like, OK, you told us that you were here and seemingly you live in up here and good for you. You know, so it just doesn't work the other way around. It's true, because whenever I look at Gina, I'm like, it's just getting better and better and better. And it yes. seems like. Every episode, she adds a layer to her bob, and that's how I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's how you know. And then you're looking at her house, and she has the time to build dog houses inside of a house inside of a house. And I'm just like, this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. She's my second comeback story. <laughs> yeah, I can see. <laughs> is Jen going to be your third? Pedranti? Yeah. Um... I don't know if Jen <laughs> did I catch you off guard with that one? I, no, I I are you saying that she because Jen hasn't gotten to her admitted mm -hmm. setback season. She really hasn't. She's admitted that she, you know, is in this situation <laughs> where she makes yeah. fifty dollars a class. Um, she has no money, like all of these things, but she hasn't gotten to that place where she's like, Oh, not only do am I in this situation, but I'm also not going to, I'm going to ride this situation with Ryan out. So until that whole situation unfolds, yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. <laughs> I think yeah. we might be getting that next season though. So let's, you know what? Let's head over to OC. I think that's a great idea right okay. now. My predictions for Jen, just seeing how they end the episode off with her and like I guess she's finding out more things about Ryan and she's pissed off I don't know if they'll be able to like come back from this I, because I feel like whenever cameras pick back up that means somebody's getting a divorce whenever cameras pick back up somebody's getting a divorce or somebody's getting cheated on yeah historically which one is it so that's what I'm looking at right now and I just don't I don't think cameras would have picked back up if she would have just been like, no, it's not a big deal. Like, I'm just going to stick around. Yeah. Well, she's going to, it's not a big deal it till the cows come home because that's going to be her quota survival. Mm -hmm. Like, assuming that there are some nefarious things happening behind the scenes, it's only a matter of time, but justice moves very slowly. Um, so for anybody who is wishing to see the demise or, you know, if I don't and I don't know, Ryan could be completely legitimate and yeah. just have some shady friends that he got, you know, involved with over his head, turned state's witness or whatever he did and is going to move on with his life and he'll learn from that and move forward. Maybe that's the situation. Nine times out of 10, it isn't. But there's always a 10. You know, there's always that one. So maybe Ryan's the one. I have no idea, but I know that we all know a Jen Padronti. Okay. Yes. And it's somebody who <laughs> is just firmly going to believe that if I pray hard enough, do enough Pilates, do enough things to my face and get my hair done enough, I am going to be taken care of and I'm not going to have to actually be accountable for what is happening in my life because this is just a reaction to her decision not to be accountable. She's just gone from her daddy's house to her ex-husband's house now to Ryan's house. And some people live like that. I yeah. wouldn't suggest it because it doesn't give you a lot of autonomy, but that is a way to live. And that's what she's chosen to do. So Jen is not, she going to stick beside him. She is going to stick beside him. And it is very confusing because I would, I would think that she would just, play it kind of smart and maybe utilize the situation for what it was, for what it is. Cause I thought that's what she was doing. Honestly, just in the background, I'm like, she seems like this is benefiting her right now. I know she has her kids and she's just trying to stay afloat. Um, but I also know that that Beverly, not Beverly Hills, that OC check, it might not be the best. No, but, especially not for a second season housewife. Yeah, I would think that she would at least have something to kind of like at least 
keep herself together for a while until we get to that third or fourth season. Or maybe she's in fear that they might give her the boot because she's not bringing anything. Like, I, I, I really don't know what it is. But I'm always very intrigued when it comes to her because I'm like, what is her next move and how is she going to handle this? Yeah, well, here's the thing. If she was smart, then behind the scenes, she would be doing all the things that she didn't do in her first marriage. Like, I hope she has an LLC that she's mm. putting all this housewives money into and all of the endorsements and sponsorships that she could potentially be getting. If she is buying $2,000 dresses, I sincerely hope that they were purchased um, in cash so she can return those and get that money back and put that into a bank account. I'd be opening up an LLC for my children to put allowance in there yeah. so that we have something when they graduate. I think that Jen kind of tells me through the story that she always is going to have a safety net and that likely will be her parents. So I think that's another reason why she's not too stressed about it, but that's a lesson for parents of means too. You know, mm -hmm. the, you can't coddle your children too much because then they just never learn to fly. And now you just have your baby bird with a whole lot of chicklets to take care of. You're right. Maybe, see, maybe she needs to talk to Buffy Purcell too. She does. She really maybe, does. I'm gonna see. We're gonna. I'm gonna tag Jen in this. Yeah. <laughs> just in case you're wondering. And then we're we're kind of seeing things play out with Shannon Bador, and also there's some stuff circulating about her possibly not returning to Housewives of OC, and I am not surprised by that at all. Seeing how they just like constantly bring bring Alexis Bellino around and how Tamara is just like all buddy buddy they're just like the double mint twins they can't even separate when they're in the same scene together yeah that Shannon may not be returning is that what you're saying yeah Shannon might not um, be returning to to OC yeah um I don't know I don't know if I'm if I'm gonna believe that but um I do want to add this as long as you're gonna tag Jen Pedronti in this mm -hmm. um she needs to go and get that ring appraised by an independent jeweler. There is a lot of stuff happening right now, okay? Um, a lot of people are having things put on their fingers that they don't know what they are. And if you think that you're going to take that ring and you're going to live off of it, I would get it appraised when times are good, okay? Okay. Oh, that's, Yeah. <laughs> That was good because when I seen that ring, that's the first thing I thought. I was like, mm. <laughs> get it mm. appraised. Yep. I can tell you some stories off air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, this is enough for my condo, uh, girl. That's not enough for uh, Honda, okay? Which would be a lot, <laughs> still would be a lot. Um, but a condo, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> I don't think that Shannon uh, Bador is ever going to just step away from Housewives. I could see if they did a recasting of some sort, then Shannon would probably be the first to go because so much of the trajectory of the storylines relies around her victimhood. Yeah. Uh, but I think that she's safe. I just feel like I, I kind of understand where she's coming from because her whole thing is that she wants to set healthy boundaries. And while I believe her intent is good and well, it's just how she goes about saying all of this stuff and running away. And you know what? It, it also bothers me that these ladies don't understand. They're like, she just keeps running away. I'm like, she. it's clear that this is a lot. Like, I would yeah. also get up and walk away. But it's annoying at this point. It's annoying to the yeah. audience. Like, because what is the subtext of, of any one of these women getting up and leaving? Mm -hmm. That means that filming, it, it shuts down the plot line of filming, which means that everyone has to stay for longer. So if you're thinking of it for, like, the production angle of yeah. it, it's like, I can, can see we that. please just get some either movement of the story? But stop Jensen? bringing John Jensen up. Now they're bringing him to the event. Like, what? it is just to the point where they just do not care. They're like, you're going to talk to John and we're going to get it on camera. 
Uh, and it's so annoying. He has such a punchable face. He does. Uh, <laughs> but yes. wait a minute. Let's can we talk really quickly about this before John Jansen even got there? <laughs> so when Shannon approached um Katie's husband. Katie's husband. <laughs> What I had to rewatch that scene. Like five, that was so literally fighting with herself. Me. That poor man. I <laughs> that was so funny to me. And she's just like, "What are you talking about?" Like, <laughs> and it's just uh, it's the funniest thing, and that's what makes Shannon good TV though, because this man has no clue what's <laughs> going on, what she's talking about, what's happening, and she's like, "I hate, I can't believe you said that." Like. I hate that you said that. It's like, are you arguing with me? And I'm like, lady, you are arguing with yourself. <laughs> what, what is happening? And he was so in the cut. He almost looked like he was hiding in the pillar. He wasn't lit. Like, yeah. couldn't even tell if he had a microphone on. I was like, why is she out of How every... did she find him? Is that my question. Was so strange. Like, I wanted to ask, like, what can somebody tell me the problem? And she went directly to him. Like, she did not pause. Like, she just went straight up to him. And I'm just like, has John Jansen been recasted? Like, with Katie's husband? Because I'm just like, I just didn't understand. I'm like, what are they trying to do here? What is the goal? So bizarre. And I was like, oh, my God. Shannon looks like she took some crazy pills. Like, I mean, in a totally different way. Because it really was like... She was manufacturing this argument and this altercation. And then she started arguing with herself. Like that man was like, all he looked like he wanted to say was, lady, please just leave me alone. Please yeah. Alone. He was parroting back what she was saying to him. Like, <laughs> I'm done. I'm leaving. Well, maybe you should go. And that was his tone. <laughs> She's like, I can't believe you said that. Like, why are you saying it? And I don't know. It was just, and he has the most relaxed face. Like, yes, that's the funniest part about it, too. Yes, yes, because he knew, like, clearly he's just doing it for his wife. Like, he doesn't seem like told he's her. mixed up in the drama. And he's like, I literally got pulled into the drama just standing there minding my own business. Like, it was wild, <laughs> wild. And that was very funny to see. Um, and I also noticed it's always Emily that says it. Like, as soon as Shannon leaves, she's like, why is she leaving? Why do they keep, why does she keep doing this? And I'm just like, she's had enough. She's tired of this. Well, Emily says it because she's a lawyer and she's used to billable hours. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> you have a point. Yeah. yeah Emily's boy. like, we are on the clock. This is the hours that I was scheduled to be here, and now you are prolonging production. <laughs> Why does she keep walking away? It's that annoying. Bill for more hours. I understand it. You know what? And I never even thought about it from a production standpoint. I was just looking at it like, I'm, I know she's just tired of this whole thing. Yeah. Well, Emily, because Emily's also she's somebody that gets very irritated mm -hmm. if things are belabored like to exhaustion she just openly shows her irritation about it mm -hmm. so it's not surprising that you know it's almost like again she's a lawyer she's like asked and answered like <laughs> let's move on <laughs> let's just move on forward <laughs> i'm also not liking tamra's little smart remarks I know the real reason why she's upset with Shannon now and that's because mm -hmm. Shannon exposed her on doing that background check that's really why she's not feeling oh, Shannon yeah, yeah. right now yeah yeah that was she didn't see that coming like, she did she was really <laughs> blindsided by that for real for real and on top of it I think by Jen's reaction, I think Tamara was like, oh, I broke the straw. Like, you know, or the, I broke the camel's back. Like, that was the straw. Because mm -hmm. once Jen went that direction, there was no coming back from that. 
And Tamara had gotten her all the way to that point, but then Shannon pushed her over the edge. So her vitriol for Tamara, I mean, that's going to that's gonna play throughout the reunion. And I love that. And I can't wait for it. Shannon was very smart with that. Oh, yeah. And I was not expecting it. And then, you know, Tamara tried to also include Shannon in it, but it didn't it didn't work out as as she planned. And how do you feel about Alexis Bellino? Do you think that she should stay for next season? No. No? Okay, great. We're definitely on the same page with that. I'm ready for her to go. We don't need her. She is like one of those people that just pieces together everything that worked for everyone else and tries to create a story out of that. Like yeah. she pieced it together so much this season that she pieced together a whole man and tried to make it work. It's like, I can't, I cannot. There is just nothing like she, she the thing about Alexis too, is that she's playing housewives of yore in a current landscape. Like she's still mm -hmm. the same like mentality of housewife from when she was on what like 10 years ago how long has that been it's been a while probably like 1905 yeah like bc <laughs> so <laughs> it's like girl christ is risen what are you doing it gets old like it it's just so not old. like are you gonna bring your sky top back too because i i'm not understanding where what's going on here it's it's weird to me i don't like it and then with the lexus i think the biggest thing was and not a lot of people paid attention to it or i don't know if they just moved past it but it was like literally her recreating shannon's life like you said like right. taking pieces of shannon's life taking images of her dog and going to the shelter and being like, I want one just like this. Like it has to be single just white, like this single white female. Like she is, there's no way that you're going to, going to ever convince me that she is not obsessed with Shannon. And it's strange. Like, I don't know. I would have picked somebody else to be, obsessed with in that I would have picked Tether DeBro honestly. That's who, I, I was thinking the same thing. We are, <laughs> we are right here. I'm like I would have been obsessed with Heather. I'm not gonna lie. Because um, I want to know like her and Terry and how Terry always has her back and how they're in sync. Like mm -hmm. there's never any time where you catch Heather saying some stuff and Terry's not like 10 toes down on it. He's not aware of what's going on. They talk about everything. They yeah. move at the same time. Because they are a partnership. Mm -hmm. The type of partnership when you know people got stuff to lose. Yeah. They really got stuff to <laughs> lose. Okay. Like we are not. This is the program. We do not deter from said program. Mm -hmm. We come in as a unit. We come out as a unit. Like and that's it. It's how you protect your ass and sets. Okay, assets. Yeah, <laughs> protect it all. <laughs> I agree, and that's the one thing I might not agree with all her antics, but I just love Heather and Terry's marriage. Yeah, I do too. That's a, that's something that they're not going to be able to shake up like that. If Heather is ready, and I don't even see them leaving. I, I may be like a separation that they don't discuss on camera, but leaving each other in the divorce, I, I would never see that for Heather. I can't see it. Honestly, I can't see it for either one of them. Mm -hmm. I think that they're two people who recognize that they're the strongest together. And I would agree with that. I really would. Yeah. Like, And who wants to like divvy up all those assets i mean i want to keep the condo in balboa and the house in beverly hills and wherever else they have places like i i want that portfolio i'm not dividing it up you don't get i i can go to montana too <laughs> and that's what i want with the ice sculptures and all like exactly i need it all exactly. but that's OC, guys. I don't really have... Did you have any more thoughts on OC? Because I feel like that's that was... Yeah. Um, 
Not really. I did think that the exchange between Katie and Heather was an interesting one because mm -hmm. I felt like we saw Katie's mask shift. And I'm not saying like she's fake. I think everyone wears a mask, but generally there's continuity in the mask. And I felt like there was something that happened in that moment where she was like, okay, I'm like, you want this? I got it for you. Like with Heather and Heather was like, you know, kind of bring it. Um, I think that that's it. And it happened, of course, in the finale. So I'm curious what's going to happen in the reunion, because I think that that's going to get real dirty. Do you see her come? Do you see Katie coming back full time? That's tough. That's tough. I see I think, friend of vibes. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I really, I thought that dangling the carrot of uh, visiting her bio mom in South Korea was something that was like potentially a plot line for, and not to say that that's why she's visiting her, but like the timing of it happening also seemingly coincided with potential filming. So... I don't know. I that's tough. I don't know. And did you see the uh, reunion preview where uh, it was mentioned that Sutton felt like Katie used her? I've seen that, and I was like, "Child, child, child! Like, what is happening?" And and can we just bring Sutton on? Like at this point, no. Yeah, I'd love to hear. I'm well. You know, Andy's gonna ask on a watch what happens. Yeah. Oh. That was yeah. very correct. Like, I don't know all the concepts because they love to break up scenes and then mm -hmm. you just never know. But I'm very interested to, to see why she felt that way. And I kind of understand why she felt that way. Like, if I really think about this season that just passed. Why Sutton felt that way? Yeah, because it just seems like that was really Katie's end to the show. But you know what? Then again, I don't know. Well, I have heard, um, and I can't remember the source of it. It had some, it was somewhere around like the Noella era. And uh, -huh. uh it was talking about how you remember like Noella had all of these photos like on Instagram and stuff of her with like different housewives, like in social situations. And so Someone was breaking it down. I can't remember who it was, but they're like, you know, a lot of these new women are getting on these shows by showing that they have like access or a direct relationship with someone who's already in a franchise, regardless of if, if it's the franchise that they want to be in or not. Yeah. And that that is another way to like kind of get yourself out there. And so if Katie was doing that, I could see Sutton being like, yeah, so she expressed interest in this, which was my charity or my whatever. And it was all a big ploy for me to eventually, you know, like help her get ushered on the show. So I wouldn't be surprised. I think that I think that's kind of like the go. You can kind of tell with mm -hmm. some of the Instagram, you start seeing people in this one, that that one, and then they pop up, you know, on a franchise. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, I don't necessarily know if it, that's that. Well, I haven't looked at, I guess I have to look at her Instagram. I know because, I haven't looked either. <laughs> and I'm not really interested in looking. I don't know if that's like, not to be rude. Like, I just don't, that's how I feel about her life. Like, I like her. And I think I would appreciate her more as a friend of. But even when she came on, I'm like, I'm not really interested in her because of Sutton. I like Sutton, but it's not like, I say aside from, what's her name? Jennifer, Jennifer Tilly. Mm -hmm. That's the only person that I genuinely care about that has like a <laughs> connect with mm -hmm. Sutton. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's that, you know, it's, if it's the Sutton side of it on the OC, it might just be like them talking mm -hmm. about how basically that's a way of saying like, you're a user you know, like you're an opportunist type thing. That's what how I was interpreting it. But again, we right. haven't seen it, so we don't know what the context is. Well, 
That's that's oh see uh salt <laughs> just wrapping things up with Salt Lake City. How are you feeling? I want to I want to know your thoughts on Brittany. What do you think about Brittany? Oh, Brittany. Oh, gosh. I've gone back and forth on this because uh, the Osmond came out and said that he, she basically used him and his famous last name and uh, something to the effect of the reason why I stated that we were friends is because she didn't want our relationship to be the the nature of our relationship to be known, something like that that he posted. And then I think he deleted it. Um, so my first thought was, Brittany, like, you got to get some self-esteem because the way that this man is playing in your face and in, in ours is just disheartening. Like, it's embarrassing. It's It should be embarrassing to you, but I have second embarrassing, embarrass, secondhand embarrassment. Lord have mercy. Second it happens. embarrassment <laughs> <laughs> watching it. And so I kind of was like, oh, like, how did this woman end up on the show? She has no backbone. And then it became like, is she the problem? And now I'm like, I just think she's someone who doesn't know herself. Like, she just doesn't know yeah. who she is. And I think a lot of people get to that age and that stage of life and just don't know who they really are. And what's, I can't, for the life of me, that's what I was actually looking up at the side. I'm like, what is his name? Jared. I always forget his name. I yeah. find it confusing that he would make a post like that and say that type of thing, like alluding to the fact that maybe she's using him for the show. When like, didn't he show up to the party? Yeah. That... I think that's why he deleted it because that didn't make any sense. Like you showed up to the party and you were yeah. like, I was just in like the neighborhood and I just kind of heard about what's going on. That's strange like you I know it doesn't take men a whole lot of time to get ready but like you showed up in a suit it's not like you were driving you know yeah. back to Target and stopped in. looking like, dapper like yeah you showed up like you were ready to be on camera and film so I don't know like it, <laughs> maybe they're both playing us yeah and even that but that's why I kind of live for Brittany I don't know I like I like Everything that's going on, even when she pulls him outside and she totally ignores Aaron. I'm that just like, weird. it was very weird, but I don't know. I liked it. It gave me sets in the city energy. Like <laughs> it gave me Carrie and Big. It gave me this is what. it. It's like they just have their own separate storyline going on. And I don't even think it, about OC, not OC. I don't even think about Salt Lake City when I'm watching them together. It's like their own little separate show that yeah. they have. And I'm kind of invested. I am not, but I love that journey for you. Um, I, <laughs> I can see <laughs> I can see that being interesting. I guess I because I'm like I, I've said this before, but I'm 43 and I clock things differently than I did, you know, even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like for people of that age, and I say that meaning like they're probably like maybe in the 10 year mark around my age, somewhere in 10 years, that that's not OK. You got to give that play play up. It's like, why are y'all wasting each other's time? Just... Mm. Either be together or don't be together. Like this melodramatic, like it just comes across so juvenile to me for people who have children and, you know, 50 years on this planet. Like, why are you in a, a triangle right now? Yeah. I, it's just... It's very strange. And then the whole caveat that she's made about like, oh, yeah, when we break up, I just get right back out there and start dating again. She was and, lying. And Heather's giving us in the background like, yeah, we're all just, you know, boinking each other because that's it's very small community. And of course I know him. Of course I know Jared. Of course. I. So it's like, why are you bringing around this community peen? Like, I don't. It's just like a round robin of community peen. 
I don't think that she even has any interest in Aaron. I don't think, I do think if they have a sexual relationship, it's not really happening often. It's might have had, it might have happened like maybe twice or like three times. But also because Jared probably wasn't returning her phone calls. Like, I think her main focus right now is Jared. And I thought that thing was a big lie. Like, everything that she said about getting out there and, like, just going out there, like, as soon as it's done, I just did not believe any of it. Like, you're lying. Yeah, yeah, she wants to be Brittany Osmond in a bad way. She really does. She does, but it's, like, it's intriguing because it's, you're watching her crash out. She's crashing out in front of everybody, and she just doesn't care. And I don't know if that's what makes me like her and respect it because they're trying to talk to her and she just does not care. Heather's tried to talk to her at least three times and she's like, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> she, she goes right back out there and she continues doing what she wants to do. You gotta know, you gotta know when to hold them, you know, you do to hold them. You know, you know, walk away. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> but she's not. And I know I she's know. not. She's not ready yet. Even when I kind of believed her the first time when she was telling everybody, she was like, I'm done. I was like, okay. But as soon as she's like had that little lunch with him, and she was like, We're just gonna be friends. <laughs> Listen, stop. Okay. You play too much, girl. You play way too much, and I like it. Just okay. keep doing it. Who do you think? Okay, actually, let's do it this way. Out of a hundred percent, who do you think is playing in our face more, Jared or Brittany? What's the split out of a hundred percent? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'd say Jared 70. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think Jared, Jared is the most because he's trying to play up and make it seem like it's not really a big deal. Their relationship, it, it's it's very confusing. And then we're seeing these text messages. There's so many things. I'm stuttering because it's literally so many things. We're seeing these text messages and I literally screenshotted them so I could be nosy and zoom in and read them. And he's, like, texting her. He's calling her babe. He's being affectionate towards her and romantic towards her. And then it goes right into, like, buddy mode where they're friends. And then now you just gave another example of where he's, like, explaining how, oh, she's trying to, like, use me for the show or whatever. She's trying to attach herself to the name. And then you're showing up at this party like it's nothing. She didn't invite you to the party. You showed up. No, that is true. That is true. Yeah. And she wasn't texting him either. She kept leaving him on red and he kept texting her back because it seems as if he wanted to be on the show, yeah. in my opinion. Like maybe they did one of those Tyler and his baby mama packs from Love is Blind where they were going to go, they were in it together and then once she got on the show, she forgot about her partner in crime. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it's giving. I think that's like, what it is. But I don't need you anymore. I don't need you in your local Osmond name. But he's like, you do. And then she really was standing on business. And he's like, OK, let me try to like get this back. Let me try to get this back on track. So he sends all these messages to her. Like blowing up her phone, FaceTiming her while she's on the trip. Like she and you could tell because I felt like that's the highest we ever seen Britney's self esteem on that particular trip. Like she was like feeling it. She's like, no, I'm not calling him back. I'm not answering his FaceTime calls. He's called me like four times. I'm not answering. And then once she got back home, right back to how it was. This is interesting. I'm rethinking this whole. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go with this Cobb conspiracy theory. Now, Cobb conspiracy mm -hmm. theories are based on absolutely nothing but my opinion. <laughs> I'm going to stick with the idea that 
Brittany and Jared pulled a uh uh Tyler and Bree or Brit Brit or Bree whatever uh, uh the mother of his three children are uh is and they decided that there was this opportunity for one of them to get on a reality TV show now Brittany on this side Real Housewives of Salt Lake City gets on but a part of how she got on was to utilize Jared because that sounds yeah. interesting. But Jared is only like a 10th tier Osman. So he has a famous last name, but how much power or social currency yes. does Jared have? So once mm. Brittany became a 10th tier friend of a housewife, then she probably felt like now we're even in terms of our social, you know, yeah. credibility and collateral. So I don't actually need you anymore. And that's when she went ghost. So when he showed up, it thickened her plot line. And now she's thinking, I could go from friend of status to actual housewife status. So how do I play this? I think that Brittany is actually a lot more savvy then we have given no, her, her credit for. Listen, I actually like that. I like that theory. Mm -hmm. And I would like to actually see that play out if that was the case. But it's just like she's so emotional. That's the thing that I don't understand. Unless she's just like a great actress and that's her second calling, I don't get how you can just like break down and cry in all these scenes and walk away. Like I need a moment and then we just see her fade into the bathroom. For like, some people, emotion is their currency. And Brittany mm -hmm. comes across as someone who gets things based on emotion. So it, oh. it actually isn't necessarily, you know, that she's a brilliant actress. It might just be like, this is her. There's a lot of survivalism that we're seeing in all of these shows. This is the way that I survive. And I feel like that might be a way that Brittany survives. That's good. <laughs> like that is good. Conspiracy theory based on nothing. See, now I'm looking at her differently. That is good. Is she just a shameless character? Like, is this what? Wow. Yeah, yeah that's it's and, and it also, yeah, if you there are certain people who take themselves so seriously because mm -hmm. that power dynamic. But then there's also a group of like a demographic of women on these shows who almost like illustrate self-loathing or mm -hmm. the inability to protect themselves because being a victim is how they get by. So it's just, yeah, lots of dynamics. See? Now I now I'm even more intrigued. What do you think about Justin and John and this little Salt Lake City? Oh that's what I'm gonna call it. Salt Lake City tussling. Because it wasn't really a real tussle, but it was just like it's as intense as it's gonna get, I feel. Yeah. I think seeing it play back, first of all, John was a hundred percent in the right because Justin did mm -hmm. step Lisa. Like you can't do that because he was yelling and he did step at her like if but the problem with John's thing is that we saw it play back and he was still smiling when that happened so what happened between him actually getting activated I believe is that Lisa's like you gonna let him step to me like, yeah it was probably that look like yeah check some shit now yeah so i <laughs> that was a little like it felt it felt like it was a mountain out of a molehill it did not need to get that serious yeah. um but yeah that's why i was like did something else happen because john was like smiling he kind of turned because i replayed it because mm -hmm. they replayed it and i was like well why didn't he why wasn't it an immediate like arm up between you and it, it, between him and your wife yeah like just knowing justin's character at least are seeing him on the show so far i don't think that he was going to physically do anything i just think it was one of those moments where he clearly got a little bit too carried away yeah um 
And that's just something that where he should have stepped back. I don't mind him defending his wife because that's his wife, you know? And honestly, that might be their primary source of income right now because I don't right. think Justin is working. So he's like, you're not fucking my shit up. Like, yeah. you're going to respect her and let her sell her pieces on Alibaba. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to move forward. So I don't know. I don't know what it was. I also know that Lisa can get carried away too. Like we we seen yeah. her go from the table. We seen her get up and just like I don't know what she did. Like this spin around the room, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she's like, "I'm calling the police." Like everything oh, that escalated like too so much. fast. Like th- I think she was doing too much. And then it's like with that whole Justin thing, I just thought it was way too much. I'm like, everybody just needs to calm down. It was way too much. And honestly, when she was on the phone with her private investigator talking yeah. about the police involved yeah. about a stupid rumor, like this is, didn't we go through 2020? Did y'all learn nothing about calling the police for stupid <laughs> stuff? Like, you really on these cameras, Mm -hmm. on my TV, talking about calling the police over an Alibaba rumor that you're claiming wasn't started? I mean, there's not even, like, a libel suit in this. Like, you just are mad that someone said something about you that you didn't like, and now it's a police matter? And I don't know. I thought it was really funny. (laughs) I I thought the whole thing was ridiculous, because I'm like, the police are obviously not going to do anything about this but just the fact that she's like you know what i'm going to call the police like you've just gone too far i'm going to escalate this 10 times higher and i'm not even going to step to you i'm not even going to put my hands on you i'm just going to call the police now i I and even whitney's like but wait i didn't really say that you did it i'm just saying like this is what was brought to my attention. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's when I was like, okay, Barlow, you're doing a bar lot. Okay. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just at that point, yeah. I'm like, you lost me. You lost me. Like, fine, you didn't say it, but we don't need to call 911. All right. Yeah, because I don't know if she said it. Because there's a lot speculating and going around over the fact that he is also saying he wasn't the one that was on the phone with Whitney or something like that. Yeah, and yeah, that the call was... So, mid- yeah. I'm I- like, I don't know. Lisa Barlow probably called him and gave him the same speech. Keep I- playing with me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No. Let, we, let Leave the police out of it okay please we only deal with the fbi on this franchise okay i want to ask you something very specific and then we'll wrap up what mm-hmm. did you think about bronwyn's tour with heather and the dog shit on the floor like what did you think about that uh, oh. <laughs> i had to bring it up like as soon as i seen it i'm like yep yep you know you know, I, oh, so, Trifling. I, so my beloved dog, Spike, just passed away a couple months ago, and he lived to be 16 years old, mm-hmm. and I do understand that senior dogs become a little senile, they have, a, a, Spike had a diaper for the past, like, two years, so I understand that things happen. That being said, ain't no way. Okay? Ain't no way. My dog wore a diaper for two years. Yeah. Okay? Um, there has to be something, especially with the multitude of dogs that you have in the house. You just told us we don't need smell of vision because your house stank. Like, we we now know. We now know. That's crazy. And it was like multiple and production did her dirty. They did because they didn't even show her cleaning it up. They just showed her walk downstairs and offer some like, do you want some 
raisin bran do you want some bagels and some fruit yeah yeah that was like projection. she pissed somebody off because that poop was not fresh poop and that uh urine was almost completely dry so those items have been <laughs> i'm like it's the house that damn big to the point where you just miss well but you can't have ain't no, no way no. ain't no way no, because if you're letting your daughter, that's not the first time. And then there's what, six of them? So they're just going and peeing and pooping on top of each other's stuff. So that's got to be a constant. Like having that many dogs in the house, like you have to have like a house manager. You have to have like people who are helping you with all that because that's Something. a lot of square footage for a lot of dogs to be leaving gifts all over the house. Not okay. Mm -mm. Not okay. Like I said, trifling. I really was like, this scene can honestly end right now. That was, yeah, she made, <laughs> she put somebody off in production because the show yeah. that, that was almost as bad as, um, what's homegirl's name? Ashley's house from Love is Blind? Oh. Was, no, Alex's house. Alex's house? Her hoarding what? house. From this season? Yeah, I did. I miss that because I I definitely see with like the clothes like falling out of the closet and like boxes what? everywhere. You hardly see the floor. I seen Tim's. You didn't see it. You clearly. I did not see Ashley's. Once you see that, you can't. I see need it. to see Ashley's. I need to go back and watch because I did not Alex's house. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get their names confused. Yeah, I I seen Al, uh Tim's, but I did not see Alex. Yes, Tim was a very like organized, a little too organized. I was like, okay, yeah, he no, this yeah. is we all know, we all know <laughs> what's going on there. This is too much, and I would love because I really want to get into. I cannot wait until Tuesday, guys, because I have so many thoughts on this reunion. Vanessa pissed me off so bad because I felt like. She wasn't really asking what I wanted her to ask. Like I know. It was I'm... just so much going on. And well, um, I can't wait to hear y'all's take on this love is blind. Cause I've listen. been every time I always like refresh, like, are they gonna talk about love? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Even when it's like last week, I think the or no, it was this week. The reunion came out on Wednesday. So we couldn't talk about it because we record the pop culture episodes on Tuesday. But I was like, we're still going to give our reunion, our pre-reunion uh, predictions. Like, um, So we'll definitely get into it. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Erica. You. I want to know, where is there anything first that you have planned, anything that you're working on right now? So um, as you know, Aaron, because I was like running up to my studio to get here, I am in school right now. I am a part of the Goldman Sachs One Million Black Women, Black and Business Program. Um, the great. curriculum partner is NYU Stern. So I have been in school since the fall, I guess we're fall, winter, but um, I started in the fall and it's an accelerated program for anyone who is a business owner, Black in business. Um, go check it out. It's an amazing way to scale your business and it's, it's amazing. And I so appreciate the program. So that's what I'm doing right now, but okay. we are also, um, in the production space. So I'm constantly creating my business is the production company comeback TV pre presents. So we are in the B2B space and that's pretty much what I'm doing. But of course I'm still dropping episodes here and there of comeback TV or excuse me, come back with Erica Cobb on YouTube. It's Comeback TV. And uh, you can check that out. And you are doing amazing. We will definitely be supporting and promoting all these things. I'll definitely link them below. And for the for the Black business owners, mm -hmm. uh, is there a certain link for that? So if you go, just Google, mm -hmm. I, I, I should know, but just Google Goldman Sachs Black in Business because okay. all of their programs, I'm a part of 1 million Black women, but I know they have other programs in the Black in Business category. And for your um, listeners who are in business, you should definitely yes. check it out. See if you're eligible for the program, it's an amazing 
amazing course. Um, mm -hmm. And it opens up your network exponentially. So let me know if anybody applies based on my recommendation. I know that's right. So y'all go right ahead. Um, make sure to follow Erica on everything as well. I will attach her socials in the description mm -hmm. and make sure to check us out as well on patreon.com, patreon.com slash Bravo Wild Black. Until next time. Bye y'all. Bye.